Get into another edition of I Am My Brother's Keeper version of the Garage Department. I am the Funky Millicent Hadar Jones. And as always, I got the tribe with me. So go ahead and introduce yourself and let the people know who you are. Oh, Mama, there you go. And from parts unknown, it's a mod. <laughs> Absolutely. We're a man down right now. We went out there with D-Mac, but I know who knows he might jump in and, 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 and contribute something a little later. But I man, we've been... What, what do you think he's doing? I think he's napping. I believe he's, he's asleep. Might be napping. That's I'm a hard record, man. <laughs> I'd, put hard record, man. I'd put money on him being asleep on the couch. Absolutely, he might be napping, man. But hey, so we 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 started this series. Of course, it derived out of the the the, the outrage we feel about the uh, uh, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd murders. Um, but we said that we were going to make this a series because we wanted to talk about a number of things that that needed to be uh, adjusted. Because, of course, it is our responsibility to save ourselves. Of course, we can sit up here and we can rely, we can try to rely on, on the actions of others. But truth be told, ain't nothing going to happen until we do it ourselves. So I got two young brothers with me. One is, uh, he's a little bit older, but he's still a young brother. I knew him when he was a young, young man. Now he's an older young man. I got my former coach. He on freeze. Oh yeah, he he, he tripping off that uh, that Android internet over there. That's all good. <laughs> no. I, roast until he come back home. Yeah, I know. He just got that computer repaired. Ah, uh, hey man. Uh, oh, there he is. Need to repair that internet too. Yeah. Repair right. that <laughs> you might need to get one of them Harmony computers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They probably took those back though. Why not? Well, here goes. We also got another young man. Good job. Hey, everybody, we're going to do introductions. Uh, introduction. No, uh, you. If you. Correct me if I'm wrong. You, you, everybody else, we, we smooth. Yeah, I know. So I'm fine. Yeah, you were the only one. Oh, you're back now. You're back yeah, now. Yeah, I think you're good now. Oh, yeah, killing me, man. Yeah, killing me on my introduction right now. Xfinity's killing you, not me. <laughs> That's why I did it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Right? They're like, I'm sure they're I guess, man. So I got a. Uh, I got two gentlemen who are in the front lines, man, who are uh, first to have a unique uh, uh, point of view, vantage point, because they are not only educators, but they are also administrators. So they are uh, on top of having the responsibility of educating our young people, ability, of uh, disciplining them when necessary. So uh, I invited these young men that we can discuss their uh, the roles that we could play in in, in in molding our our young boys and girls and girls into to, to responsible men and women. Uh, I got Norman Holmes and who are you going by? Matthew, you just Matthew, Principal Matthew, right now. I guess I guess, I guess I guess for these purposes today, I'll go by my government. My name is Kyle Mackey. Wonderful to see everybody. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> so welcome to the show, gentlemen. Welcome to the show. <laughs> we'll, we'll put the sound effects in later. Yeah, we'll yeah, insert yeah. applause. Oh, God. Yeah, anyway. So, 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 gentlemen, um, basically, like I was saying, because um, it's no secret that uh, education and, and education correlates to, to now, I, will, I don't want to say success, because, you know, success, success is subjective and relative based on, you know, how people uh, uh, view success. But uh, 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 basically, there is a pipeline from school to the prison system. 
of course, it's no secret that um, the less educated you are, the more. This guy oh, here. boy. In 2013, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Justice said that uh, 37% of America's prison, male prison population. So, of course, we know that a lot of that correlates from uh, um, um, our school system because at the same time, um, black males are suspended and expelled at a dis 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 uh, higher disparity than any other ethnic group. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was the importance of, of education, of course, the importance of early literacy and what role you guys are playing to help combat these many statistics and, and what what all we This guy here, I swear. <laughs> He might have to get on the phone. I got you. Yeah, well, he I, might I guess have for, the, for, the, for the sake of the conversation, I think I kind of saw where he was going. Uh, Brother Holmes, right, if you don't mind going first, uh, go seeing this how and, and I didn't get a chance to to to, uh, to hear what campus that you're currently at, but I know you said you had done some work at at Yates and you know uh, and, and some other campuses. Um, just a little by, by as far as my background, I started out uh, teaching seventh grade writing at Holland Middle School, and then I transitioned um, my, all my administrative experiences actually at the elementary level. So I get a firsthand experience. I got a chance to see what, um, what students look like coming into the middle school, and then now what students, how we're preparing them to get, pair, get prepared for that transition. So you, you mentioned the, the, the word early literacy and how that plays a part in it. Uh, one thing that we try to do at my current campus is to make sure that we focus a lot of energy on our first and second grades. Uh, they take what is called a high frequency word exam. And those high frequency word exams are the, the words and the terms that you see every day. Uh, you see them in your newspapers. You see them on your, your billboards. They're the most uh, highly common words that you see, uh, you know, just, just out when we're, we're in the streets. So we, we emphasize that and we put a lot of pressure. I'm not going to say pressure, but we put a lot of energy into those grade levels because we know once they get to that third grade where that statistic comes from, you know, they say, you know, the amount of students that can't read by the, by the third grade, they, they have the highest, you know, proportion of, you know, that's how they're building the prisons. But we, we combat that by making sure that our students are reading and not only reading fluently, but they're taking what they're reading and then they're also able to begin writing out and formulating their own thoughts with that. Um, I think that that's a, that's a, that's a big part of it that I think that a gap that we missed or that we are missing is that, of course, it's good to be able to read and, and see what's down on paper, but these students, they also have a lot to say. And once they're able to kind of read and then kind of formulate that and pair that with their own thoughts, they actually are a lot more creative and they, and they, they have a lot of things that they want to put together themselves. So it's important that we give them, and we, we have different outlets. We have a high-frequency word circus. We have different uh, performances and different things that we put on for them so that we let them know that we're encouraging. We're proud of them that they know how to read. But now let's take, let's take those high frequency words. Let's take that skill. Let's take that fluency and let's apply it to something else. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think it goes back even farther than that. I think we need to, if we really want to fix this problem that we have with our literacy, we, we got to go before, we got to start before pre-K. PK three, because you know, like I know, research say we need to start teaching our kids how to read between zero and three. And yes, I said zero. Right. Now you might not think like they're uh, absorbing information, but they are because those, those those brain stems are starting to connect, and just teaching a kid words and sight words. I, I, I can attest because I have a, a daughter and I think I started teaching her how to read when she was like three months old. And she's a very good reader now and got a lot of creativity. And I just think we should start educating our community and getting them to understand, stop waiting till your kid come to pre-K 
to start showing them sight words, putting those words together. And it, I mean, they, they should know how to read when they come to school, at least our kids, because guess whose kids know how to read when they get to school? Everybody else's. Everybody else's. Everybody else's. And we're missing that. And then we don't have a, a good, we're ignorant to that because we think in our community that the school is supposed to do it. But you know, when we say your parents is your first teacher, that's what we're talking about. And I don't think they get that. And, and, and I wanted to add to something that you said, because you are 100% correct. And it, just, and it just made me think of a thought. Because when kids come into school, they already, they have their own little personalities. And it's, not, it's, it's usually based upon the environment that they've grown up in. So if you, I know we're going to touch a little bit on discipline. And if those kids are acting off of what they know and what they've seen. So if a kid is able to talk, you know, they've been potty trained, like you said, that that time period, uh, time period where they're absorbing a lot of information, if you can actually jam pack that and build some good, some, 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 some good habits and some good strategies and build them with some positive information, that'll actually set them up moving forward. So I 100% agree with you on that. I just know that, you know, that I know that a lot of the times we have a lot of parents that miss that or that don't do that or feel just the opposite of what you said, who feel like, no, I'm going to send them to school. Right. And y'all do. So I know that when we get those kids in, we're, we're behind the ball and that we have to do everything that we can do to get the ball moving with them. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, because I'm not an educator. I'm, probably, I'm the only one in this room right now that's not. Uh, my wife here is. But uh, I know she did not want to be on camera. But anyway, um, she is. But, um, you know, I do work with kids in certain other areas in sports, and I do notice that, um, you know, the programs in, in, in the youth sports that I do, the best programs are the ones that have parental involvement. So, you know, as far as uh, everybody else kind of having a head start on us, how important is parental involvement? And when you have kind of low participation amongst parents, how much can the school and the school system actually do to make up for that? Well, let me, uh, uh, actually, I concur with what uh, Mr. Holmes and Mr. Mackey were saying about there needs to be parent involvement. I am on the high school level as an educator and like they were saying, I see these attitudes, these personalities. And their attitudes and personalities directly affect, are directly coming from their parents. And their parents are saying already that they didn't like school. So when that is reinforced at the mm -hmm. home, that they didn't like school. They don't know anything about what they're learning. They don't know how to do the math. They could barely read what they read. What they're reading is boring. All, all such and such. It not only puts us behind the eight ball. It's almost at war because those kids are general, generally, yes, they want to learn but they're already on the defensive as soon as they walk in the door. They don't want that structure. They want the structure, but they don't know how to handle the stru structure. That, that happens at pre-K. Exactly. And, but the, the, and I'm sorry to kind of, that was to caveat to your uh, question, Maude. Because uh, yes, we see, we see our kids the most out of, out of the parents. We see them eight hours a day, every day for five days a week. Parents get them on the weekends, if that. You know what I'm saying? So they're looking at us, but yet they're not reinforcing what we're teaching. They'll go home. That Now they don't have too much homework, but they go home and lose everything we just taught because it's not being reinforced. Right. The kids could be like, I mean, the parents could be like, y'all, you should be doing your homework, but 
If the kid doesn't understand it, they may need somebody to read the instructions to to help comprehend or help break down what is being taught. And if the parent A doesn't like it or A or B doesn't want to do it because they I give them a bit of doubt. They worked all day. You know what I'm saying? And they don't they're tired. I give them that. But they do put a lot of onus on us to pretty much develop these children. But once they leave the schoolyard, the rest of those 8 to 12 hours, it's lost. Because they're not being, they're, it's not being reinforced. And I'll, I'll, I'll yield my time to the rest. <laughs> Well, uh, okay, so I got an interesting perspective on this, and, and, and it's just to support what you said, Brother Jones. I, I was listening to uh, this white random person explain uh, racism and how they were harboring their parents' racism, and they was feeling a certain way because it was the it was their parents' racism that they were feeling the anxiousness and the anxiety that that she was having. She was saying she got that from her parents, and I think we can correlate that to how some of our kids approach education, even in the elementary school. By by the time they get to high school, it's already there. It's ingrained. Yeah. So their 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 racist feelings, I guess, towards education. Is, is is it starts because of their parents might have had a bad experience or they didn't like school. Mom didn't like school. So guess who else? They, they, the kids hear that and they're conditioned to feel the same way. And I, th I say that to say we got to start changing that culture in our community. We, we, we really do, because we, we got to start doing things for ourselves. I think that's what this forum is about, right? Learning how to do things for ourselves as a community. We know what the problem is. It's yes. the solution. Right. You know, and, I'm, and I'm glad you said that. And I just, and I just want to, and, I, and again, brother, I, I, I appreciate a lot of the conversation that's going on, because I think that whether we whether we stated it or not, I think we all have a foundation. We, we, it just, it's not written down anywhere. You know, you know, unfortunately, but we all kind of we all are kind of agreeing and we all agree on some of the foundations and have some of the same the same ideals on how how things have been going on. So like like uh, like Mr. Holmes just said, the the uh, the biggest thing is to come up with a concrete solution because we all have different different ways. But if it's one thing about our community. Once we start actually writing stuff down and, you know, people have been saying this for years, we need to, you know, black people need to get organized, but it's literally, it needs to be, it needs to be written down somewhere where it needs to be followed by enough. It, there needs to be an example of it to where it works. So where people can say, okay, now I, I get it. And Mr. Holmes, what you were saying was the fact that uh, even relating it to how, you know, Caucasian students, they harbor their parents racism. It is true that students, harbored their parents saying disdain for school, that's a that's a generational curse that has to be broken. But you mm -hmm. gotta think about it like this. School really isn't the first place, and I and I, and we said this a little bit earlier, school isn't the first place where students should be getting their learning from. School, I, you know, if you know when the Lord blessed me with some children, school is literally a a a breeding ground for where you learn key skills like networking, working with others, you know, how to how to manage uh, you know, when you don't get along with people, manage your anger and, and tight situations, the real learning continues to go home because if you're getting it at home, when you're learning stuff like, you know, again, time management, you know, all of these lessons that they don't teach us about, then you're able to translate those over into school because the school system right now, whether we want to say it or not, and as an educator, I will say it, it's very repetitious. It's broken to a sense of our students aren't really learning at the rate as other countries are, and, and the, the studies show that. So, if we wait for the school system to teach our students, we're going to continue to be behind. The learning needs to, to make sure that we take that it takes place in the home first. And what I mean by that is, again, we talked about sight words, but then also exposing your students, I mean, exposing your children to different concepts early, 
giving them an opportunity to be exposed to different things, take them somewhere, let them learn those things, and those skills will translate over into the classroom. Whether you like school or not, that's not your kid's fault, and that's not, it's not their problem, you know, to take on, you know, that anger or that angst that you have against the school system. Give them the fair opportunity to go out and to learn and, and, and to be able to, to go in that environment and, and, and switch it up. So they deserve the opportunity to do so. Now, um, one of the things that bothers me, um, and you kind of touched on it there about what the parents should be teaching, is you hear people all the time say, well, they don't teach credit in schools. They don't teach this in school. They don't teach that in school. Um, do you think that, because it, it seems to me that people want the kids' total education. Hey, we, hey, we, we're in the classroom, fam. Your ass is the one going to the bank. Excuse me, I'm, I'm right. not supposed to it. You're going no, to the bank. Good. You teach your kids to, to go to the bank. You teach your yeah. kids, you pull out your bills. I mean, don't don't be ashamed to say, hey, this is how we're managing this. You teach them budgeting. My father right. taught me how to balance a checkbook well before they tried to show it to me in the fourth grade. So I was able then, that's how I was able to excel because I had already been exposed to it. The key word is exposure. Whether you ever, because I have students at my campus that have never been to the gallery mall. They've never been outside. You know, of the 16 loop, that they, they, their exposure right. is low, but that doesn't mean that they should, uh, that, that they can't be exposed to different things within their area. When they go to the grocery store, learning how to, you know, how to, you know, interact and work with money, with change and different things like that. That's that's early, and those are lessons that you can transfer over into the classroom before it's ever brought up in the curriculum. That's right. You know, I I, I like to think I, I got a I got a 10 year old daughter, and my my philosophy is. Everything that she does is a learning opportunity. Whether it's a mistake, whether it's going to the bank, whether it's going to the grocery store, whether learning how to figure out fractions, what's the best buy, uh, how to buy. I mean, everything is a learning opportunity. And I don't want her to be behind the eight ball or behind the curve when it comes to stuff. Now, it, it's hard because sometimes we just not thinking you know, this is something I need to be, I, I need to be dropping these pearls on my kid. But that's right. what we're doing. We got to do it. Because if we don't, Chuck White and Lily White going to bust us in the ass for another 400 years. Right, right, right. I mean, that's the alternative. We got to start taking some responsibility. And then the formal education, the formal academia needs to be done at school. The common sense, the street, the uh, other academia and stuff, we, we, can, we can take more ownership in that. Yes, it's hard. Yes. But we got we, 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 we started last, man. We got, a, we got a lot of catching up. Man. You know, but for me, it's not that hard, I'm going to tell you. And not to toot my own horn, but, you know, when we educate the children in a lot of ways, especially our own children, our own homes, you know, you got to get kind of creative. Uh, for instance, um, something I did a couple of weeks ago. My son's a big fan of wrestling. He's got all the WWE men and all that type of stuff. So he and my daughter got together. He's six. My daughter's nine. They got together and uh, were in his room, and she was going to bring a bunch of her dolls, and they were going to be watching the wrestling matches, right? He was putting on an event. So what I had them do was I said, okay, so how much are the tickets? Okay, mm -hmm. I had them write down how much they were charging. How many dolls are showing up? My daughter even made up a VIP section. So I had them to budget this thing out. <laughs> Word up, though. And they were doing math and playing at the same time, and they had no idea. They didn't even know I tricked them into doing schoolwork, you know? It's stuff that's that simple. And, you know, I basically, I'm like, look, I just taught them how to put on an event. In a way, because that's all it is. And, we, yeah. we got, and, and, that's, and that's powerful. But that's that's not a trick, and black people need to quit saying that. Like we're not trying, to, we're not trying like that word is a trigger for me as a black man because we've been getting tricked. Like Brother Holmes said, we've been getting tricked for four hundred odd years. Mm -hmm. Like it's 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 not a trick. I need you to be a. This is an like, like he said. He teaches his children. It needs to be a learning experience for you because I guarantee you, you try to you try to run up into the uh to Reliance or you try to you know you ever want to be a business owner. These are things that you have mm -hmm. to know. And if the more exposure you put your – we talk about this uh, at the radio station. Your 10,000 hours. You can either start your 10,000 hours when you get 17, 18. 
you know, and 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 use your twenties and and sometimes into your thirties and even some people in their forties trying to trying to put your ten thousand ten thousand hours in, or you can put your ten thousand hours in as you're learning and that you're growing and you're developing some of these skills. So that way, that ten thousand hours turns into you know a twenty or a thirty, and you have that advantage uh, to go out and, and and be a young man of industry or or a woman of industry, mm-hmm. and and you have that know how because it's been it's ingrained in you. It just it becomes second nature. So you're doing the right thing by 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 having your children do that, but it's it's not a trick. It's you're trying to you're trying right, to right. you're trying to build them you know to, to be better like immediately, and there's nothing wrong. Right, with right, right. Definitely. And 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 and, and, and like you said, um, it, it's quite significant because uh, uh, with an opportunity to brag a little bit on my children. Um, Oh, brag away, brother. Brag away on them two. My boys, my boys just uh they just graduated. Of course, one my oldest was the Valedictorian and his other one was, was third in the class. And they just got accepted into uh Columbia and USC. And I know that a lot of that was contributed to the fact that um, we had them reading very, very, very young. And so and like you see it's zero to three. I'm I i want to say um I know I was reading to them long before, long before they were talking. So, and, 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 and people don't realize that that's a form of early literacy also. And early literacy affects their, their entire academic because all, all, all schooling is about is reading. The ability to read really gives you the ability to do math because math you can do anything. Yeah. You, you, can, you can do everything through reading. And also, because another reason it is significant is because studies have shown, like Mackie, you 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 um, you mentioned that um, prisons are built based on uh, third grade reading scores. Now they 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 have actually debunked that and said that that's not true. At least twenty five different states have have admitted they have not admitted to that being the case. They said it's not, and and uh, um, Studies have shown that they, they, they actually make prison plans based on a rich rate of demographic groups. But um, Donald, Donald Hernandez did a study that showed that, that students that didn't read on level by the third grade had less than a four, had a four times less likely to graduate, less likely to graduate by the age of 18 or the age of 19. And of course, that's significant because uh, another study shows that that students that about one in every ten of uh, high school dropouts end up in juvenile jail or prison. So again, it goes back to the pipeline. Now, of course, you know, again, we always, of course, again, we 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 all know that there has been systemic racism, there have been systemic things put in place to obstruct the advancement of our people, but. There is no, there is nothing systematic keeping you from reading to your child. There is nothing systematic keeping you from taking your child to the library. There is nothing systematically keeping you from getting them started early. Like we're saying, that we, it's very important that we are involved in our academia. Even if you, even if you can't read, even if you didn't like school, that should be even more motivation to go to to make sure that they 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 do better than you do. And my question, my question to you is, how do because again we, are, we we keep mentioning that we all know what the problem is. How do we reiterate the importance to our parents to make sure that they stay involved and to make this thing a collaborative effort? Because again, I'm here to help, but don't make this my sole responsibility to educate your child. This needs to be a collaborative effort. What we to make sure that the entire community understands that this affects us all, so we all need to be involved in this. Uh, that's that's the the forty million dollar question, honestly, because as Brother Holmes, he knows as he's working uh, at Codwell, and again I say he's the beginning of the of the pipeline to where I work, which is Sterling. So by the time they get in 
Brother Holmes knows that area that these kids are coming from. Uh, and which I'm sure are the same, that reflects the same where uh, the is too. But the area of the VAs, the Crystal Springs, and the dead, just the dead end period, they really subscribe to to that that lifestyle. I I that to me as I see I and at work and off times I really think about how can we get these parents that are so against they they're pretty much against education. Yes, they want their child to be smart. <laughs> they, but that magically happens. You know what I'm saying? Without their involvement. Because they know they know the the effort they put into this now uh, turbulent cycle that the kid has to fight out of. Yes, there's kids that really want to do something and they and it's that show. Even in lower in lower uh, level uh, income communities, there are kids that get out that actually make it to college or do well after high school. But there are also so many that that even at a street level, you see the potential that they can concert their energy to something else and. They just won't because those streets swallow them so easily. And it's from their family because as, as they go, it's like Mackie says and Ms. Donald says, it's the environment that they're in. They don't have the exposure. Yes, they can get on the bus and go down to, to, to the Galleria or somewhere else uh, just to – see some different scenery, but they won't. They'll be, as we see Mr. McGowan joining us, welcome welcome to the conversation, Mr. McGowan. <laughs> um, they, they just won't. They're really, it's really in the dead end, a dead end, which is so scary. Uh, and 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 the stuff that I know there's a lot of technology. Technology is great now, especially for us that are are, are educated. But the parents in these areas use the technology as babysitters. Mm-hmm. They 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 buy the Xboxes, the 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 PlayStation fours, the Playstations, whatever they whatever not you, so the kid doesn't bother them. Don't sit there and play the game. Don't bother me. You know what I'm saying? But see, those can also be tools. Those can be tools for education. So yes, I, it can be. It can be. But are they? You have to have. You have to have that broader, broader thought. These people are on on that on that 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 rhythm almost. Yeah. Go but to work. I, come I, home. Hustle. Come home. It, they have that rhythm. You know what I'm saying? They don't have that that extra that extra think out the box moment yet. And when they probably do, it's almost far too late. I, I want to jump in, G. I didn't want to cut you off. My bad. No, no, no. no. Go ahead. I just want to make sure that I that I answer her Dari's question in the sense of what what's the solution or what can we be doing right now <laughs> to kind of to kind of keep some of these things from happening. Uh, when I when I think about it, just as I continue to grow, uh, just as a black man and, and things that I see, uh, first of all, man, we need uh, we need we need something to address the traumas of our neighborhood. So we do we do need therapy. Uh, we need access to uh, like and that's mental and you know PTSD just from just just being in the hood. Like the same PTSD that we experience from gang violence and from uh, you know violence in the home at certain times. There's still a level of that that we need to walk through. And once some, you know, and I, I talked about breaking those generational curses. Once we get access and we address those traumas and we can break those chains, we'll see some stuff 
uh, students and parents also experience a lot of mental health uh, at home. Uh, so that way, if they can, and and that may, that may be due to lack of insurance, so they're not getting access to a lot of the medication, or they they have been improperly diagnosed, or you know they you know it's just something that they don't even know that they have currently. So those two things weigh a lot into we talk about the conditions of the home and then why our students come to us in the condition that they come to. Those are two things that I just feel personally this don't have anything to do with with the reflect the district that I work in or the particular students that that I serve. I just think that in the community. Those are two things that that two great great pillars that if we address, we will see a lot of different things change. Because the you talk about the mindset of people in these communities, it's not because they don't want to do any better for themselves. It's it's literally conditioning, and there and there are things that once you you get with a, a professional or you're given an opportunity to outlet and and do some other things and see some other things, those those things normally you know one or two generations they 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 seem to kind of melt away. Uh, I also want to say the fact that. Man, I, uh, my, my parents are, are very old school, and they talk to me a lot about the sense of community, literally, like, I mean, like, your neighbor, uh, you know, whether it's the, you know, the, the lady across the street, the cool cup man, you know, whatever it may be, literally, all of those individuals having the, uh, the moral compass to when they see things going on in your community, that they, they, they can, they can tell kids, or they can say, hey, this is what you need to be doing. They used to say, you know, Miss Jones down the street could whoop me, and then when they called my mama, I would get, you know, I would get whooped at the at, at the house too. We don't see that happening again because kids think they're smart now. They want to call CPS, whatever. But literally, you don't have to put your hands on a child to teach them a lesson or get them to 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 act in a certain way. Just have a certain, you know, moral compass about yourself. What would you want somebody to say to you if they caught you stealing or if they saw you acting in a certain manner? Hey, man, stop what you're doing. Hey, you know what? I know you stay up the street. And then when you, and then when that 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 transaction happens between whoever that person is and your parent, the parent doesn't always jump to say, hey, you know what, you know, you lying or you lying on my kid or whatever it may be, because technically your kid should never been in a position to do anything like that. But it's a, like uh, like Mr. Holmes said, there's a learning lesson that should happen in between that that the community, uh, not just the parent, not just the neighbor, that everybody plays a part in, and you know that old saying of you know, it takes a village to raise a kid. So. Those are just a few things that I just had on top of my mind. I'm, I'm tired of ranting. I promise you I'm going to be quiet. Brother Holmes, go ahead, man. Weigh in, please. <laughs> well, you know, I just think, I just think this, this, the systemacy that we in is, is the web is, is, is big, it's nice and deep. Um, the, you know, what, 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 what's being done to us, I believe, is intentional. Um, we got parents that want better, but they can't focus because they got to figure out how to pay bills. You got parents that want to be just like maybe all of us want to be, but you know, they might be dealing with the systemacy of, um, you know, you know, they might be on a paper chase or they might be on something that, that has nothing to do with, with their kid. And that's going to stop the progress of that kid's development. So I, I just believe that when we start looking at, you know, this in a, in, in a broader sense, the, I guess I, I would say the greater context, you know, we got to start addressing some of these obvious systemic problems that we're, we're, we're born into that we can't really do anything about, but we still got to learn how to maneuver our way through them and help our kids maneuver our, their way through them because they're going to be here. I mean, it's great. The, the protesting, yes, this is a good time for a change. It's a great time because it seemed like everybody, a lot of people, maybe more so than ever, is starting to, okay, yeah, this is ridiculous. So, yeah, we, we do need to do some things and take advantage, catch lightning in the bottle, so to speak, and try to do something to make a change. It might not be a huge change. You know what? I'm sorry to rant, but Abraham, uh, John Adams said, uh, in one of his quotes, he said, I fight not for myself, but I fight for my kids' kids. Mm. All right? And w w w when I look at what's going on, I got into education because I just had, I, I guess when I peel it back, guys, I just say, you know what? I just want to get as many guys in college and, 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 and to, college, to play college football as I possibly can. That's what I wanted to do. That was it. I ain't, I, I, that was my motivation. 
I, I was at a school where I saw a lot of talent and the, the boys were a lot better than I was. And I played college football. So I'm sitting there scratching my head. Why aren't all these brothers going to college? It, it just didn't make no sense to me. It was something wrong. And that's one of the reasons why I decided I was, I'm going to learn how to be an administrator. I'm going to learn how to develop these boys. I'm going to get them to the next level. And then I found as I, as I trudged through it, I, I just started seeing all this politics stuff that's just in, in the school system and in the community that was just going to stop them. It, it just, it, it just, it, it, it's frustrating because you want, you want better for your kids. And, and, and it's like nothing that we can do because it's, it's, it's the stuff that the little bit that you're doing is still not going to be enough to get Bubba to the next level or to develop him even in elementary, middle, or high school to getting to the next level because he can't see the greater, the bigger picture. And I think we all on, on, on different levels because I've been on elementary and I've been on high school. So I kind of seen it both in, in, in both ways. And, and, and I think we was talking about restorative justice. Wasn't that part of the, uh, the topic? Absolutely. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Right. So, you know, it, it, you know what we're doing in elementary, we're trying to train these, these, these kids, these boys, how to behave. I mean, that's why we give them so many chances, right, Brother Mackey? Without a doubt, we're we're in in essence we're we're now uh, we're in, in local parentis, uh, you know where where we are yeah. when when the parents are away, man, we are and, and again you put yourself yeah. in that role where you say, hey, man, I'm I'm trying to teach you to do the right thing, no matter how many times it take you. But yeah, continue, please. Yeah, and I say that to say because we try, you know, we got to understand that those kids, you know, these kids is coming to us with a bunch of baggage. And then when they, they're in elementary school, they're making mistakes. They, they constantly do, being bad. But I don't think sometimes as educators as teach, and, and teachers, and edu we got to understand we're developing them. We're trying to teach them because they might, more than likely, they're not getting it at home. More than likely. Yeah, go ahead, bro. Uh, yeah, I concur with both of what y'all saying. And to put in uh, Ahmad's, uh a thing uh, because it does it seems like now and the way I see it education should really be a civic is a civic duty you know what I'm saying it, it's really a it really should be based on your community a lot of our teachers at these schools should be coming uh, just like the old, uh, our, one of our old conversations, Mod, about uh, police, police, the police that are policing our communities are from the outside of our communities. Our teachers in these communities are not from these communities. The teachers are being hired from outside. So they, they don't understand, especially the white teachers they don't understand what these kids are coming to, coming from a lot of the young teachers are young and now they have money they think they're 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 hot stuff so they like, oh, look what i got you know what i'm saying all right this is what you get when you get an education but you got to understand that these kids who do they look up to what what what's their what's their community idols the d-boy the South playing State. rock, the wicked jump shot. Yeah, right. either you sell it, crack rock, or you got a wicked jump shot. And for the girls, it's even lower. And and I say that because, like you said, Mackie, that brings if if the teachers and the administrators were all from that one community, that brings the moral compass into the community. Every you can't get away with anything. Because, hey, I know who you are. I can talk to your parent after school. When I go home, I can be like, say, Johnny over here tripping. We need to talk to him a little bit. And B, when you come back to school, I can still snatch you up and be like, say, we ain't about to have a week like you just had last week. 
And now, even with that, it's it's so with the distance, it's so it's so broad that we can't. And the and the kids are so fearless, you can't tell them anything. They think they're grown before they're grown. And now that their parents are just about the age of their children, they're literally growing up with their children and vice versa. Their children are growing up with their parents. You know what I'm saying? That's why you'll have a 35-year-old grandmother. And with no with no daddy because either the daddy's outside chilling on the block, out in the jail cell in juvie, you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. And I'm not trying to say that's how it all is, but from where I see it, that is how that's how it is. It's a lot of outsour it's it's a lot of outsourcing now in America, even to the very local part. You understand? And I think that, yes, we really need to start to become a community. We need our communities need to look after our own. Because once once you let the outside in, they infiltrate in, they can do whatever they want to oppress, change the change the variable or the narrative and disrupt anything. And that's that's where I am with that. Now I'm 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 actually glad that y'all said that because that was actually the next direction we were gonna go as far as talk about the importance of mentorship and actually being uh, representative of of a community of a demographic because like you said because of the many systems that we have to combat. Uh, like Coach, you, you and I, you know, we joked about it all the time. When we were on our campus, we was the only two males. You know, we was two or three, two or four males, and out of the four males on our campus, we were the only two that actually saw the content here. So, talk about the importance of understanding that 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 your role is multifaceted. That you're going to have to wear more than one hat because, yeah. Along with being a teacher, you might have to serve as a counselor. You might have to serve as a father figure for that day. And 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 the hours might be long, but it's needed because nobody can identify with our boys and our girls the way that we can. Like you just said, my with the outside forces, they 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 can't empathize with our kids because they don't they don't necessarily understand and face the pressures and the trauma and the whatever it might be that they might be facing. So talk about the importance of, of being who you are, being in the classroom, and what we need to do to actually change the mindset and the narrative uh, uh, to get more black teachers in, in, in with black males, of course there's plenty of black women, uh, black males back in the education field. I get well. Uh, I think I, I think well. You want more black males in the classroom. First of all, you got to give you got to give uh, black males a man's wage because it's hard to convince black men to do a job and they're not making the best money. I mean that it, I'm going bankrupt trying to be an educator. Mm. And that's truth, guys. I'm, I'm I'm going bankrupt trying to trying to stay in education, and it's hard to just be in this in that field because they don't it don't pay enough. And, you, right. and, and 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 I can get on my conspiracy uh, soapbox and say, oh, they doing that to us on purpose. They want to keep it like that because they don't want us to have a you know be able to sustain a family. And be able to, uh, you know, be able to send our kids to school. We got to be out there making our own. We got. I got to teach. I got to hustle and hustle again, just so my kid can have something. Because 60, 50, 60, 70 G's ain't a, 70 stacks ain't enough in this society. And a lot, let alone talking about sending them to college. And if you do, you gotta, you know, you gotta what? You gotta hope they get a scholarship, right? But they don't. 
you know. So I, I think they they in, in, in order to make it more attractive, because in other countries like Switzerland, in Finland, they pay their teachers the top dollar. They are they are on the top pay scale. So not only are they getting the best in that field, in that content, but they're also, it comes with some prestige like it does in other countries, all right? So uh, I think, you know, that is a societal thing. You know, they think we just, you know, babysitters. And, and hey, if I'm a babysitter, just pay me like a babysitter. Pay me by the head. Mm. All right, pay me by the head. Twenty five dollars an hour, twenty five kids. So that's how you have it anyway. You're ripping me off, and you act like you're doing me a favor, and you're really not financially. You're not. So we're counting these kids anyway. Right, that's how they counting them, and they pinching off a little for us, and then they taking the lion's share. You do the numbers. But Brother Holmes is definitely right. Uh, first of all, man, teachers, teachers, we, we, it's underpaid, overworked, most definitely. Um, what I and to to go back to your point, Hadari, was the fact that I uh, I wanted to say that, man, I I have the 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 pleasure of again working in the neighborhood where I grew up at, so the kids get to see me as somebody who 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 know what it's like to grow up where they come from and see that I made it out of there, and I got and I got a little bit of sense, uh, not to brag, you know, what I'm saying I you know. I, I I bought a home. I drive. Oh, Mr. Mackey, that's your car, the man. You know, like you you have you, you know they they need to see that because again that that goes back under that exposure pile. That goes under. They need to, they need to see somebody that's done it before so that they know it's possible. I don't I'm, yeah. I don't play back. I'm not a professional basketball player. I'm not. I don't I don't sell drugs. I'm a assistant principal at an elementary school. I go to church where you go to church. Uh, I, I shop at the same grocery store that you go to. You know, my family live in the same neighborhood that you go that you that you live in, and I'm here with you seven to seven, seven days a week. So that let and that lets you and I'm still able to do all of the same stuff that you want to do. You want to talk about music, I can talk about music. You want to talk about fashion, I can talk about fashion. You want to talk about girls, whatever you want to talk about, I can I can I can meet you where you're at, but my expectation of you is not gonna lower. So that, that goes to that point. But then to go back to what uh, to what Mr. Holmes was talking about, you're talking about getting getting males uh, in education. That goes back to the, just to to what we've been talking about this entire time. That's not something that uh that the community is is pushing for us. Whether we getting paid a lot, you know, um, America has just overly sexualized. You know, what I'm saying uh, marketing, whether it's in you know just just other industries. Our kids they want to go be doctors and lawyers, but I mean if we just keep it in 100, kids are putting themselves into debt. To go to law school and then they don't even they don't end up practicing, or they 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 go to they go to med school and uh you know they you know you know they they don't never or they 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 don't make it all the way through and I'm and I'm not saying that to to discourage anybody. My biggest thing is is the fact that there needs to be programs and and again I'm just trying to think of what to 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 get a, a an immediate um kind of answer to some of these questions. HISD has a program where they basically they tell you hey look. You go to uh, you go to this certain college and then you come back and teach. You know they you know they, there's incentives for them going to a certain college and then coming back to teach because they know how important it is to see our own come back. They have a program as well for uh, administrators. You know that they, they, we're they're trying not to hire administrators from Timbuktu just to bring the HISD to keep making a mess of what we already know. When you got an assistant principal who's been at that same school, knows the community, knows the people, make him the principal. You know, he knows what's going on at the school. You know, don't you know, don't 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 go out and pull somebody from Nebraska and drop him in the middle of Acres home and think that he gonna really, you know, know what's really going on. You know, so uh, but to, to go back to the question, literally, in addition to pay, you just it needs to be it needs to be marketed in a better way. And the community needs to take a stand and say that, hey, we need y'all. So y'all need to come on for real. Yes, I, I concur with with everybody um like mr uh Holmes said it, wages really do need to just off the proportion and on thinking and theory you pay you, what do what what do we say in america you get what you pay for 
So if you if you pay somebody low wages, you're gonna get somebody who don't care, who's just going there for the job. They're just going there to get the paycheck, and they about to they about to bounce. <laughs> but if you but if you and especially the young people, because now they figured out it doesn't pay, so they'll do their five years, get their debt wiped out, and bounce. And go and and go do whatever they need, they want to do. Finally, they take five years out there. Uh, and I'm debt free now. I don't have any any debt. I can I can do whatever I want now. But if you pay top dollar, you're going to get the top percent. You're going to get people who are really trying to get that top dollar. Right. They're really going and like uh, Mackie was saying. They have to market it better. I spend a lot of my time at at uh, at my school, really telling the kids that yo, it's cool to be smart. You know what I'm saying? It, it's cool to be smart. It, it's all good. You you can be a nerd. You can you don't even have to be a nerd. You can just be smart. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because. If you're smart, and I don't, I don't mean like no brainiac, but if you're able to smart, be smart, you're able to think, think way, your way through problems. And I, I hate to, I, and I hate to really kind of combat uh, my my fellow coworkers because a lot of kids, because I work a lot in math. Oh, why we need this math? We don't need this math any other time in the it's not really about the answers you get. It's how you get to the answers. It's a process to get to the right answer. So even if you get to the wrong answer and if you write down your process of how you got it, you can always go back, figure out where you messed up, and go from there. That's what education is all really about now. It's really not about well in the statistics of in, in the data of education, what they're looking at to grade teachers and schools, yes, it's all about in the data. But in the underlying in the underlying war that people on in the schools have to tell the kids, and this kind of formulates it's it's, it's just reasoning. If you're able to reason your way to the proper answer or to the proper solution. You're being smart. But if you're just jumping out there, like they say, uh, test dummy in, then, then you're just out there as a test dummy. You, there's plenty of them. And I just try to, they just need, like Mackie say, they have to market it to where it is cool. It is cool to educate other people, especially us. We have to. As black men, we have to show other black boys that it's cool to be educated and to help educate other people. It's not just a authoritative thing. I'm smart. You have to listen to me because I know so much. No, I'm telling you through my experience as a person what I've gone through so that you don't have to go through what I've gone through. You're actually going to be better than me, and that's what we're. That's that's I think the real, in my in my opinion, the real solution in a psychological way that we have to get into get to the kids. So now, because again, we're talking about uh, uh, serving as a role model and and and, and teaching young men and young women how to act. Um, and again, because it is all relative, of course, we're talking about how literacy then affects the academia and, of course, their, their ability to think and their, 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 how they're performing in class also then affects their behavior. And, and, and I really want to pose these two to you, uh, Coach and, and Mackie, because, again, I tell you, you guys actually have to deal with disciplining children. Of course, I'm in the classroom, tomorrow you're in the classroom, and we deal with behavior. But in all actuality, uh, 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 major decisions are made by the administrators. So 
I guess my question is what 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 do you guys take into account? Of course, I know there is a, a, a there's guidelines based on how to discipline children. But what do you guys take into account when you are uh, having to discipline a kid? Because again, um, I told you we, we we lead the nation. Black black males lead the nation in in, in expenses and expulsions. And of course, if they're not being educated, then that leads to other things. So, what do you guys take into account when you're having to deal with a behavior problem? And how do you make sure that even when you're dealing with a a a, um, a habitual behavior, someone who is constantly acting out or acting up, doesn't mean that that kid can't later become a contributor to society. How do you make sure that you don't ruin? His life at such an early stage, uh, and how do you what 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 I mean what do you use and what 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 do you use to make that decision and and, and what what go what process I'll just leave it at that what 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 goes through your minds when you're dealing with behavior? Uh, I think it's important first of all to keep in mind that yeah they're they're kids but these are people uh, and the, the biggest thing for me is relationship building. Uh, my campus is, is is small in comparison to a lot of other campuses uh, in, in the district. So I get an opportunity to build a relationship with a lot of students. So before we even get to how I manage uh, working, you know, dealing with discipline and, you know, working with the, the extreme children, dude, just, I mean, let's, let's build a relationship. Let's, let's figure out what's going on because a lot of the times before you even get to it and you talk to a kid, you'll start learning some stuff that you didn't even think that these kids was going through. I can tell right. you that, first of all, our job as educators to, first of all, man, make sure that these kids' basic needs are, are met, first of all. Did you eat this morning? What time did you go to sleep last night? Uh, I had, uh, I'll give an example. I had a student uh, tell me, hey, look, Mr. Mackey, I'm asleep because I was up last night taking care of my little brother and sister, and my mama was at work. Come to find out mama was, you know, she was a stripper. So she, you know, she works at night. But and it's like he, you know, he's up taking care. He's being the man of his household, you know, while like, you know, like while his mom is is working, and it's like he comes to school, and it's like, man, y'all y'all expect me to be alert, and I'm a kid, and I need to be sleep, but I'm taking care of a kid. So I say, you know what, man, he he, you know, he's he's sleep in a classroom, and it's not because he wants to be sleep, and he's not acting aggressive because, it, you know, for the environment, he's not enjoying the environment. The, you you be up all night. And then somebody try to nudge you up, you know, or something like that. You're gonna you're gonna jump too. You're gonna act a certain way. So literally, figure out what's going on with these people, first of all. Did you eat, man? What's going on? Like, figure out what's going on. And then from there, you talk about not ruining the kid, find out what they're what they're really interested in, interested in, excuse me, and then try to tie that into what's going on. I know you can't always tie playing football or rapping into math and you know, all that other type of stuff like that, but literally this I incentivize it all the time. I I look. I spend a lot of my time telling kids, "Hey, look, the first hey, the first person that can uh, make sure that their homework is turned in this week by Friday, I'm coming through as an administrator. I'm coming through. I'm doing a homework check. Hey, I'm who was Miss uh, Miss Miss Johnson? Who was the first person that did this? And I'm literally showing them, hey, I'm rewarding you for basically doing what you were supposed to do. I'm you know so literally when when they see that happen a lot of times, that that usually gets a a certain amount of students, but then there are normally those those one or two that you just feel like, man, you know what, you know, the Lord got to crack the sky and stop time to get him to to do what he needs to do. Literally, those students, we we have we have a place for them. It's not just me. It take a village. Sometimes it take mom and them coming to sit in the classroom. If mom and them not really, you know, with that or they're not or they're not able to, uh, me literally coming and sitting down. Spending my time and just being like, hey, what's up? So here, I'm, I'm going to sit in here with you today. You tell me what's so boring about this, or you tell me what you can't get with this, or you tell me what you can't understand. A lot of the gaps come from, again, students not being able to read, uh, some sort of, you know, cultural or language barrier in between it, and then them just really just not being able to relate to what's going on. So before we even talk about behaviors, these students have a lot of needs that they feel like they need to get met, and I'm responsible. I feel like I'm responsible to making sure that they're in a comfortable enough environment to where they can receive the learning to take place. So, you know, Coach, uh, you know, I want to talk to Coach and and, and also to Mackie because I know Mackie is heavy in the music 
and uh, you know, coach, uh, of course, working, uh, you know, coaching football and that kind of thing. So I'm in a lot of schools um, as an official, and uh, a lot of people outside, and when they criticize us as a community, they say that we're so we're a little bit too focused on things like music and sports. And I know Maggie doesn't like this when I said about as far as tricking the kids into learning, you know, I usually counter to a lot of these people and let them know that, you know, if you go to a lot of these schools, a lot of schools in our communities, most of the boys that graduate have something to do with sports or band or something. So how important are the extracurriculars? Um, and how can we, in a way, use that and maybe start those being sponsored at an earlier age to sort of keep the child engaged? You know, I played ball, and I knew a lot of guys that was – the only reason why they made that 70 was because you needed that 70 to play in the game on Friday night. You feel me? Yeah. I had plenty of guys, just give me that 70. I just want that 70. So – how do you see uh, um, sports and extracurriculars and the, and the arts and things like that? Um, should we start those in schools at an earlier age to sort of keep the child engaged? Well, that, that's right up my alley. Um, got my mic on. Okay, yeah, that's right up my alley. Um, I, I, I'm an I'm a advocate of starting to develop them at, at elementary school age. Um, and holding them to the same expectations as we do kids in middle and high school. Um, no pass, no play. Um, at the school that I'm at, um, the coach, something happened with the coach, and, they, you know, I wasn't doing anything. I, I, I stopped coaching football to work on my study. I was like, nah, I'm just working on my study. And I got enough of my study done where I had a little bit more time where I could do some, do, do some coaching because, you know, as coaches, y'all know, you start missing the grass underneath your feet and the wood underneath your foot or whatever the field you want. You start missing it after a certain period of time because you, you've been doing it all your life. So <clears throat> he said, well, I need, a, I need somebody to coach the, uh, the, the, uh, the basketball team. And, I was, and, and traditionally, I had a sports program at, at Hartsfield Elementary. And the thing that I did was <clears throat> I tied it into the behavior. So I called it, this year I called it uh, the uh, Hartsville Elementary um, Positive Behavior uh, Sports Program, something like that. And what it was, I had teams on every grade level, from fifth grade all the way to, pre to, to kindergarten. I had a bitty ball team, and this was just basketball. And then right after basketball, we was getting ready to go into baseball. But I was going to have a t-ball, and, 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 and I told the teachers, I want the ones that it's going to help, the bad kids that it's going to help. Don't just give me good kids. Give me the bad kids that's going to make them thirsty to play, because if we can get them on the field one time and they get a whiff of competing and, and the energy, it changes their behavior. And, and when I tell you, uh, I, I made them go around with a behavioral sheet for uh, their teachers to get them signed. And let me tell you, when they didn't get them signed, ask me if I let them touch the floor. Nope. Ask me, did they sit on the bench and watch? Yep. You can ask, you can ask Big Me if he didn't see them standing on the edge watching. Because I was like, this is the way it's going to be. When you get older, when you go to the next level, even though the next level is middle school. So I'm a huge advocate of developing kids, getting them ready. And if that helps they focus, because just like, my, like, like maybe some of you, that, that was the focus that I needed to stay and, and, and do well in school in the past. Whether it's high school or elementary. Athletics and extracurricular is a vehicle. The likelihood of you making money doing it is lightning eaten by a shark at the same time. It more likely is not going to happen. 
the likelihood of you getting to the next level is highly likely if you put enough effort into it. Okay, so I teach sports extracurriculars as a I tell my daughter that all the time. I said, this is cool. It, it makes the important stuff possible because the important stuff is the math, reading, writing, all the different stuff. I said, this is still really is not exciting, but the extracurricular is there to keep it exciting. And so I, I, it's a vehicle. It can help you get to the next level. I mean, we got to teach them what it's there for. Because Chuck White don't 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 have the ability to make themselves billions of dollars to the next level. So we got to get something out of it, and we got to do the right way. Because hey, we don't make enough money as educators to be dropping. Thirty, forty thousand dollars on 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 uh on college education, especially if you got two kids close to the same age. How you gonna afford that? You gonna go into debt if they go to college, you know? So, you know, I'm a big advocate of it, bro. So, I believe we should do it and do it stronger, especially in our communities, because our communities need it. Now, I don't know about those other communities. But I know our communities need it. And, and guess how much it costs them to play or participate? Zero dollars, zero cents. So everything that I get them involved in costs them nothing. So, yeah, I say do it and, 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 and write grants for it and, and, and do it as much as we can. If that will get them to school, because you can't practice unless you come to school. And if you don't practice, you don't play. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and and I'm telling you, it changed. It changed. I had a kid. I had to pick up. Coach, just come pick me up. I, I, I'm on the way. Just make sure I'm getting to school because he was coming to school late every day. If, if, if it, whatever helps. And I'm a big advocate of it. It, it helps. So, go ahead, uh, Brother Jones. Uh, I agree with, with what everybody's saying. Uh, I started, well, when I started in the high school level, well, this high school level, it was in the behavioral classes. And the teacher that I was with taught me a lot about, I know Maggie don't like people saying tricks, so I won't say trick, but, and I don't like this word myself, but manipulation of the kids. Uh, like he said, like Maggie said before, some of these kids, especially in our in our communities that we worked, they have beyond grown people's problems. And so just the basics that they need put a smile on the face. Not only not that they get it, you know what I'm saying? Not that they get get the uh, get the reward, but it shows that somebody cares for them. Um, the teacher that I was with, she would say, "Hey, if y'all have a good week, and y'all do all y'all's work for the week." On Friday, I'll buy you some chicken from Popeye's. Do you know these kids will work their ass off? This for two pieces of funky chicken? <laughs> <laughs> and they were happy about it. You know what I'm saying? They didn't have to pay for it. They don't have to pitch in for it. Now, some days, they may not have a good week. Some days you may not get it. Some days you might have to, if you're not having a good week, you might actually have to chip in. So it's actually teaching them a lot of things, responsibility, accountability, and just like uh, Mr. Holmes said with the sports, it's the same way. You won't play if you don't do your part 
in getting yourself eligible to play. It's not hard. To, I mean, it may be hard, but it shows it. It gives the kids some in, incentive and to show that they're actually good. Now, some of those bad behaviors that won't stay well in class, maybe you have to give them a different job. Maybe that person could be your office runner. You know what I'm saying? Maybe that person could be your your picking up papers type person, passing out papers type deal. They're they're more of your your assistant, your helper. And that that's what they really pride themselves in doing. And and that that also manipulates them to be engaged into the class. Because you'll actually find out they'll I hate to say this word too, they'll turn snitch. Like, oh, such and such talking uh, you be the same one. But now nah, dad, you wanna you wanna help the teacher out. Because it gives you a self a, a sense of pride in or that kid gets a sense of pride in they're contributing to the classroom. And I think that's really what we're all trying to get back to now is giving these kids some sense. Like, like the so yes, the slogan says Black Lives Matter. We're trying to give, give these kids a sense that they actually matter when the world is showing that they don't matter. And through these manipulations and through the athletic uh, rewards is a good way to show that they can contribute. It's not it's not always academically because who knows they may not be so, so strong academically. They can make skim by by the grace of God or the grace of their teacher or this grace by their by their teeth. But it 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 builds on to the building block of their character that they can be a a positive contributor in society doing the things that uh, Mr. Mac, uh, Mackey and Mr. Holmes are talking about. You know, I'm going uh, to I know I'm gonna wrap this up in a little bit, but I just got about two more questions. So now... I got one more myself. And we're talking about uh, incentivizing to help curve performance and to improve production. Um, restore the discipline. And for those who don't know what the restorative discipline is, that is uh, it's like an alternative. It's rather than giving students a harsh suspension or an expulsion, um, um, it allows the student uh, to restore or to fix the damage that they caused. Or it's a, um, uh, an opportunity to go back and correct um, whatever wrongs they have, they have, have, they have committed. And again, I'm posing this to my two my two principals, and then of course you gentlemen can, can comment on it because um, first off, what is your position on it? Uh, are you know are you a believer in it? And, and how do we keep the balance of um, of course being consistent and setting a precedent, but not allowing students to manipulate that situation uh, um, because they know well I'm not going to get any harsh harsh punishment behind it. All I got to do is this. All, all I got to do is sweep the hallway. All I got to do is clean the cafeteria, whatever whatever their uh, 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 action might be. Uh, so how do you feel about it, and how do you keep it from becoming uh, uh, less than effective? All right, well, first of all, I think that it's important to state the fact that re restorative discipline doesn't mean the absence of discipline. That 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 it's just a another way to approach it rather than the cut and dry three day you know or sack or you know in school suspension or whatever that may be you know when you deal with it at home because at the end of the day we know that sending a student home for three days or sending sitting them somewhere where no instruction is happening is a detriment to that child's growth period so. By, by, by those standards, by all means, yes, I am a proponent of restorative discipline. Again, to go back to a statement that I made earlier, 
before before it even gets into the the realm of having to deal with uh, addressing a, a, a disciplinary infraction by a student, you as an me as an administrator, I feel like it is my job to make sure that I have some built up some sort of relationship with that student and and can be sensitive to what they have going on, but then can also know how to address this student, how to de-escalate a lot of situations to where it doesn't have to always go to a, I need to pull you out the classroom. Sometimes you have to be so tactful in your de-escalation, uh, you know, uh, you know, strategies to where a lot of things before, and then a lot of times we, we, we tell our teachers this too, learn how to just de-escalate stuff. And, oh, you know, I know all the time, hey, some kids, they get tired of, you know, hey, JJ keeps slapping me on the back of the head, so I turned around, you know, and I punched him in the mouth. You know, you know, there there are certain there are certain, you know, things to address those type of situations. But when you're talking about just a student that is just just going all at it, make sure that there's a relationship with their there first. But then again, so to go back to the point that I originally made, it doesn't mean that it's the absence of discipline. We're literally we're just we're pulling in all all of the stops to make sure that before we get to a situation like that, that we've done what we need to do. So whether that's sitting down and uh, we uh, I, we adopted a program last year, we did a project class and it, it addressed a lot of the uh, the social skills of the students and then it, it gave them an opportunity to have many counseling sessions. It allowed them to do, uh, when they come in and maybe they got into it with the student, they can do peer de-escalation and then that way a lot of times that's building up their communication skills so that they can express their frustrations and they can stop with a lot of the antics that they do and then once they learn how to communicate and they take that back into the, to the classroom they're better people you know it's not just about addressing the, the the you know that disciplinary infraction now we're we're changing these students for you know for the better you know so whether it's a wraparound specialist whether it's a counselor whether it's dealing with me the administrator we're just pulling out all the stops to make sure that we address that hatred before but to me it starts with um you know that relationship and then also just learn how in de-escalation tactics, period. Yeah, I, I agree with them. Um, restorative justice for me is, um, you know, trying to find out, you know, where that kid is. You should have a rapport with, 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 with most of the kids uh, by a certain period of time um, as an administrator. Um, I look at elementary school as a training ground. so where some teachers think that, you know, he should be suspended. No, because if he's at home, he's not learning. We, 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 can, we can find other ways to discipline a kid other than sending them home where he probably more than likely wants to be anyway. And they'll, and they'll do that just so they can go home. So that, that, that option should be off the table. Um, sending kids home and, and not getting any instruction when we're already behind, when uh, data is, 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 is so important to, uh, to, to your, your existence, you, at home is not an option. Um, over this pandemic, I'm like, you know, I'm glad we started doing things virtually. Um, now these kids, we, 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 we need to do something with this virtual learning. So when they're not at school, they need to still be able to, to get on uh, and, 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 and pull up uh, their lessons so they won't be so far behind uh, when they come back. Because uh, I think we need to take come, come up with something innovative where we can uh, take advantage of that. But I, I don't believe in uh, sending kids home. I, I, I do believe that elementary school is a training ground where you have to use it and, and, and teach kids. Now, if there's a lot going on with that kid, we need to get some type of behavioral plan in place to help uh, deal with and de-escalate their behavior, uh, give them some way to, to get out. Hey, if the kid needs to take a time out because he's exhausted or tired or he's feeling some type of way, let him go because it, 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 it's, it's easier for us to do that than it is but to let him mess up the uh, learning environment of the other kids. Um, it's about developing the kid. And I, you, you don't want to make them soft. And just like he said, restorative justice don't mean, no, just, don't mean you're not going to get reprimanded for what you did. It's just that we're going to find another way to do it. Um, 
Some kids, and it do also depend on how egregious what they're doing is. Because some kids, as they get older, their offenses get more egregious uh, as to what they're doing, you know, jumping on people, fighting, you know, it's just total misconduct, and you got to deal with it accordingly, depending on what level it is. But when they're babies, nah, they ain't helping nobody. Um, and, I, you know, I, I just don't see how that's, you know, you develop. They got might have a really bad home environment that they're dealing with. So, um, you know, we got to get them ready for middle school. Because when in middle school, you're taking your hands off of them a little bit more, and you know your you, you discipline. You got They got to start believing that you know when you do this, this is gonna happen. Because when they get to high school, if you do something, you know they can walk you up out the school because the, the consequences get even stiffer. So on my level, I just believe in you know. Dealing with kids, uh, developing them, uh, depending on their age group and how egregious their uh, the, the, uh, their offense is, how often they do it, um, and then it, then that means you got to start looking at what's going on at your house. Why are you still doing this? Is your parents giving you the support that you need? Because uh, it might be a whole bunch of factors going on there. Yeah. Um, okay. And. Um... I'm going to try to keep my last question as succinct as possible because it's kind of layered. But one of my things, uh, one of the things that I've seen uh, and that my opinion has kind of changed on over the years, when you go back and you look, you know, everybody remembers the great debate, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, that kind of thing. What do you guys think about sort of like, because – one of my major problems with education now is that it seems to be sort of one size fits all. So everything seems to be headed kind of towards college prep. And a lot of these kids do not see themselves in college. They have no history of anybody in their family being in college. But you know what? My uncle Joe got a house in Pearland. He a mechanic. Uh, you know, my uncle, uh, you know, Roger got a Twit card. He worked down at the port of Houston. And, you know, he got a nice truck, nice, you know, they see things like that, but we reinforce to them, no, you got to stay on this college path. What do you think about sort of having a, like a, um, a vocational option for kids to pick where they, because I'll tell you this, when I came out of high school, I had a great high school education, went to a great schools my whole life, but I couldn't do anything once I got out except go to college and keep studying. That's basically what I learned how to do. And these kids' education does not seem to transfer to them over to sort of a, an upgrade in the quality of life. What do you guys think about bringing certain vocational programs into the schools? Because they're kind of all, it's all post high school now. If you want to be a barber, you want to do any of that type of stuff, you got to go to community college and pay for it. So do you think there's that? Okay, because uh, <laughs> another thing. Um, I had a friend who was uh, from Nigeria. He was getting into trouble in middle school. His parents said, screw this. We're sending you back to Africa. You're going to go to boarding school there since you want to act up here. I met him back up my junior, my sophomore year at U of H. Now, he went down a college prep path in his British education in Nigeria. And his high school diploma was equivalent to an associate's. When he got there, he didn't have but one more year left. Um, but they also have a vocational path that kids can take over there where they can learn the trades. What do you guys think about that? Do you think that's a viable option? Do you think that will help uh, us as a community sort of get jobs, get some economic uh, security, and then that goes forward in the future? Then, okay, I was a mechanic, but now I have the, um, the, the, the economic security where I can make sure my kid goes to tutoring and my kid is ready for a college prep path, then he can go be a serious college student. What do you guys think about that? Is that a viable? Go ahead, Brother Hall. Uh, I'm just going to say this. They, they, they took that away from us on purpose because when we were contractors, when we had carpenter skills, 
any type of skilled labor, and they started funneling us to college. We get out of college, we in debt. We we in debt a hundred grand before we even get a job. But if we would have learned the trade, we could have started our own businesses and we could have been self-sufficient. We could have built our own communities. But they started taking those things away from us, like in the mid '70s. If I'm if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong, um, they started pulling those, those programs out of schools and start trying to make it seem like. You know, you should go to college. You should go to college. You should go to college. I, I, I get that. Some of us do need to go to college or, or we're, we do have the aptitude to go to college. As long as we're going to college learning a skill that's going to get us to the, that's going to get us a good job. You go to college and you're going to learn art history. You're going to go to college and you're going to learn, you know, whatever it is you're going to go to college to do, make sure it's not a soft major because soft majors ain't going to yield you any money. I'm a victim of that. I'm a victim of going to college. And the only thing I understood was playing football. That was it. Now I got a good ed high school education. I went to a Jesuit school where I'm from. I'm from Akron, Ohio. So I went to a, a Catholic all boys school, sort of like straight Jesuit, right? But I got there because they they wanted me to play football. And then, of course, nobody was really giving me back in the early late seventies, eighties. They weren't. We I wasn't getting no pearls. Yeah, they were saying doctors and lawyers, but that wasn't on my mind. That wasn't on my mind. I was trying to figure out, you know, I'm trying to go play ball. And, and after and, and 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 after going to college, spending you know I didn't have to pay any money. I didn't have to. I wasn't taking out any loans until after undergrad. But the thing is, why didn't I? I should have. I could have been doing just as good learning a skilled trade, welding. Uh, I could have been a bar. I could have did anything and been running my own businesses because now when I see brothers that do have their own business, I'm in a sense, I'm kind of envious of them because you know what? They ain't got to deal with Chuck and Lily White. They ain't got to deal with the, the status quo. Now I'm trying to figure out, okay, I want my own. I want to work for me, but I got all this invested in education. So I got to figure out how to parlay that into my own business. So long story short, bro, we need to be promoting learning. K-12 is to get them ready to go learn, a, uh, either go to college or go learn a trade. It's your training ground to go learn something that you're, whoever you're going to be. That's what you need K-12 education for. Because if you can't read, you can't write, you can't do math, how are you going to get that certification that's going to yield you a lot of money in, in, in your future? So we got to make sure our kids understand that. And I don't think our kids understand. We just get, we getting you ready. We getting you ready for life. You said something about why don't, you know, when are we going to use this algebra? Well, you might need to know this algebra to get into a training program that you really want to get into. You know, you, you, you might need it for that. You, it might not ever help you at any time after that, but you might need it for an interest exam or to, to qualify to be in a, a program or something that you want to be in. So I, I, I don't believe in funneling kids to college because all college is going to do, if their parents don't have enough of money, which you know we don't, to, to pay it right out of pocket, that kid going to be in debt before he get out if he don't get a scholarship. So I'm all about promoting learn a trade, or if you're going to go to college, go to college to learn some STEM, science, mathematics, technology, engineering. If you're going to go to college and learn those things, right. college is where you need to be. Mm -hmm. But other than that, go learn a skill. We got to have our own businesses and our own communities that we can flip our dollars in. Stop giving them to Chuck and Lily White. And when one black man's business don't treat you right, we'll have another black man's business to go to. And 
he'll lose his business because he ain't treating his customers right, which is right. the community. So if we only got one option, that's not enough. We need to have multiple options so we can flip our own dollars. Um, so, hey, in my next life, I'm going to learn a skilled trade. I'm going to learn how to put down floors or something, y'all. Yeah, man, because, you know, what kills me is when so many of our people put that kind of thing down as if it's not because I tell, I'm like, do you know how it's high level thinking to be an electrician? Yeah. You have to be a problem solver. And I, and I want to tell some of these, gee, I'm like, okay, well, take your smart ass out there and switch out your breaker box and don't die. Do that. <laughs> don't kill yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's almost like you think, you know, people think they're somehow dumb because they're going into a trade. So, yeah. Do you got anything on that? Uh, I actually do. First of all, fellas, uh, I, I'm still considering going to go sign up at the Acres Home Barber School. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I'm still saying, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hey, look, man, if it's two things my pops used to tell me, man, he said, you're always going to need two things, man. He said, well, he, he said it was three things. He said, you're always going to need a uh, funeral home, you know what I'm saying? And you're always going to need a trash man. You know what I'm saying? But then he also said, you're always going to need a barber, too, because niggas want to niggas wanna look like something. But, um, First of all, just to answer your question, they, they actually still do it to a certain degree. It's just not like how it used to be. First of all, back in the gap, I remember Barbara Jordan. You used to go to Barbara Jordan and literally go for anything. Mexicans was working on cars at Barbara Jordan. Girls were doing hair at school. You know, like it was it was it, it was literally Barbara Jordan the school for careers. And it was literally setting you up to, to do that. You know, uh, and a lot of especially for me, I think I may have been like the last class that 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 went into it and literally you where you can go and you can work and you can do that because I, I know I know some guys right now he got him he got a mechanic shop literally that's where I take my car to because I because I knew him from high school through a friend of mine who went to Barbara Jordan you know what I'm saying we would always go to the dances I met him at a dance he was working on cars then as a tent grader and you know it's 20 odd years later you know and you know he's working on my cars now but I said all that to say no, it's, it's, again, this goes back to pr promotion. You know, it's, it's marketing. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's, nobody's telling our kids that the stuff that's been, just like how we get pumped, a bunch of foolishness in the media, we get to a certain degree, we, and to a lesser degree, we're getting that in the education system where, yeah, we want kids to go to college because that's helping to boost the, the economy right now. You know, debt is good in a capitalist society because now you got something to work towards. You put, you're funneling money into the system. And it all and it all works out, you know. But again, if you don't have that education to talk about deferments or you know hardships and all that stuff, yeah, you're gonna get jammed up, and you're gonna face a lot of hardships because of uh, because of college debt. I was one of those uh, those individuals that they you know that they would say that I went to to college for a soft skill. My major is in journalism because I thought I was gonna be the next Stuart Scott, you know. But you know the the thing about it is is that. It don't matter which you can go to college for photography, whatever it may be. There just needs to be, whether it's at the college level or even if it's at the high school and even the middle school level to a certain degree, they need to show, there needs to be, when they talk about doing career day or having people come out, if I have a barber, you know, come to my campus and he says, oh, you want to be a barber? Well, hey, this is the curriculum that you need to follow so that you can make sure that by the time it's, it's time for you to do that, do you need to go to college as a barber? Tell the truth. No. You don't, but you know what? You need to you need to know basic mathematics. You know you need to uh, you need to know about budgeting. You know you need and, and let kids pick that track. You know HISD. You know I, look, I love my district. You know there there are certain tracks that you can go on to follow, whether it's aeronautics, whether it's fine arts. You know communications at Yates High School. You know where you can go and you can do those things and you can already start preparing yourself to do that. It's just not as prevalent as we need it to be, and then. As a black man in the community that works at a fine arts campus, that works with uh, lower socioeconomic uh, areas and students, these kids need options. You know, uh, Amal, you talked you talk a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, just basketball or, you know, or being a doctor. They need to, there needs to be other stuff in campuses outside of just sports. So if they want to pick and choose, let, let Bobby pick if he, if, if he really want to play football. And if he do, hey, we're going to push Bobby in that football. But you know what? If Bobby say, you know what? I like playing football, and I'm going to play. But you know what? I'm also really into, you know what I'm saying, STEM. I'm also really into robotics. Let that boy go do 
you know, robotics so that he can maximize his potential because what they're not telling you is that, hey, look, uh, Mr. Holmes, hey, he's blessed. He got a full scholarship. He was able to school and get a, and get an education, you know, for, for free. He went back and extended his education, you know, and, and I can only assume that, you know, that comes with, you know, uh, a, little, a little, little more dollars because, look, I got my master's degree and, it, and I, and I over and got it because, you know what I'm saying, because it, it, it hurt me. It's, it's in my pockets. You know, I didn't have a parent that was doing uh, – <clears throat> Hitwood, Hazelwood, or anything like that. You know, I made that decision to do that, but whatever. I digress. Give these kids a, a, an option to do that so they can maximize their potential, whether it's going into the workforce and they know what they need to do, or if college is the, the correct path that they have an opportunity to do, do so. Stop lying to these people. Stop with, because, uh, you know, lying by omission, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're just not saying it, you know, and you're not giving us the information. That's holding us back, too. And our community... Man, we need as much information as we can get so the, the veil can be taken from over our eyes so that we can be successful. Yeah, you know, I know it's late, man, and, and, and I, like I said, I'm trying to be as brief as possible, but this one here is, is for Coach Holmes uh, uh, real quick because, Mackie, you just said something real interesting about, okay, Bobby said, he, he, you know, he likes to play football, but he also has an interest in robotics and things like that. Um, and allowing him to also explore that, explore Model UN or anything like that, right? So, Coach Holmes, you actually played college football. So, in a way, is um, our kids getting scholarships going to sports, uh, you, know, you know, athletic scholarships where you're going to have, which is almost like having a job because you're being compensated to perform a service. Uh, you know, you're being compensated in education to go to practice every day, to go to film, special teams meeting, uh, a defense meeting, linebacker meeting. You got all of this type of stuff. So what if a kid does have another interest? Let's say you are a really good linebacker, but you also want to be pre-med and want to major in biology. You have practice in the afternoon. What do the coaches do? Do they encourage you? If they, you know, you might have practice in the afternoon, but you got a 4 o'clock lab. You can't major in biology and play sports then, can you? What did the coach say with that? What, what would have happened if you would have gone and said, well, I got a 4 o'clock lab, coach. I can't go to this film session. Hey, you, you know, what, what would I say to that kid? Because, you know, that happened to Robert Smith. Remember Robert Smith played for Ohio State? I with, do. With, I with, do. With, yeah. with, right. Because his class, one of his med class, he wanted to be a, a, a doctor. One of his uh, pre-med classes was conflicting with uh, – was conflicting with practice, and uh, he didn't want to. He, he was like, I, you know, I want to go to, I want to go to class. I don't want to go to. Um, I, this is more important than that because the reality is this: he's going to make more money as a doctor than he would as a professional athlete. Because I got a friend right now that's a doctor, a physician, and the amount of money that he'll make long term. Will out will will be way more money than what he what anybody the most athletes because my cousins and friends who play professionally that football money gone <laughs> it's gone and you know over a sustained period of time you figure to, even today if you look at how much money those guys make you know football players get paid worse you know even though the, it's it's that eighty twenty. 20% of the uh, players make 80% of the money, and 80% of the players make 20% of the money. So most of those guys is making, you know, a half a million or a million dollars. But then you got to pay your taxes, and then you got to pay your agent. So you might be walking away, depending on what end of that's, if you make it a half, whatever league minimum is, you only make, you're only walking away with maybe a, a quarter of a million dollars. And, and that's if you only play one year. Okay. I would tell that kid, if I was a coach, I would I would tell him, look, this football thing is lightning in the bottle. It's only going you're only gonna have it for a little bit of time. But being a doctor or going to med school or a biologist, you can do that for 30, 40 years. Now the numbers were for me, I would encourage the kid to go to class because I was I, I got my I got kicked around. I mean Man, that 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 
sports is only going to be around, you know, you're only going to be capable of playing football for a little bit of time. And everybody ain't going to be no professional. And then if you are a professional, you're not only going to, you might only play, especially if it's football, maybe about five years. If, if, if you're good. If you're, if you, you no, know, if you're better than good, if, if you're really good, yeah, yeah. If you're just good, you're really good. three or four years, yeah. Because most of the guys only play three or four years. So right. I would encourage him. I would encourage him to pursue a a a, a career, a, a real career, not uh, unless he's an exception. Like like Robert Smith was an exception. He quit. And got drafted and played for Minnesota and made millions of dollars and then he went back to school. But everybody not like that. He retired early and everything. He retired after nine years because he just didn't want to play anymore. He really wanted to go back to school. Right, right. So it, it, I, I, I'm going to encourage a kid every time. If he's taking a rigorous major, like engineering, biology, anything, come on, man, you got to go, go on to class. Cause I got a I got a cousin right now that was uh that, that goes to Cal Berkeley, played free safety, and one of his classes was conflicting with practice, and he's in a doghouse with the coach right now because he was going to class and not going to practice. And you know what I told him? Fuck them. Cause five years from now you're gonna be. Doing, you're gonna be, you're gonna be whatever it is this major is. I said that's what you're gonna be doing. You're not gonna be more than likely. You're not gonna be playing football. Now, do you think a black coach or uh, an HBCU program or something like that would have more empathy for that kid? I think so. I think an HBCU would, and uh, maybe a black coach, depending on how cooned out he is. <laughs> okay, there is that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you get a lot of, and, and you know, that good old, you know, they cool, man. They they, they try to keep their paper. So they, you know, if you are one of the better players, they want you. But schools should make accommodations for, for those kind of kids. Um, whether they, hey, l- let them do it online. If it's not a face-to-face class, if it's a lab, they got to they gotta make accommodations because we we smarter now, man. We not we not meatheads like we were in the eighties. You know, we didn't know any better then. Now we're smarter. So um, hopefully they 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 smarten up and they won't put a kid in that position. Um, but I do think a HBCU would make accommodations. I think I don't know. I didn't. I never went to an HBCU. Right. But, right. Um, and I and and I have met African American coaches that are so cooned out. You didn't know who you was dealing with. You, it, it wasn't us. Let me put it like that. When you when you dealing when you dealing with a recruiter, do you put do you put pressure on the recruiter? Or do you mention something of that sort? Like, hey, I got a kid who's really focused into this. Um, if, if 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 you don't have his best interest in mind, then no, nah, I don't want you recruiting my kid. Do you do you go so far as to say something like that, or do you just because you I, want him to have the opportunity of going to school for free? Do you well, do you, I, I, I don't, I, I want all of them, I, you know, I want to get my kid, my whole passion was I, I want to get my kid in, in, in college. If if they were able to share with me, because very few of them ever shared what they were going to focus on, but if they did, I would support my, my kid. Because if you lie, our, our saying as coaches is if you lie to a recruiter, they'll, they'll never come back and, and, and take your word for a kid ever again. So I always try to be transparent with them. If I know that's a kid's desire and passion, I'm going to let them know. Because I had to do that with uh, – uh, he, he ended up over at U of H, but he went to uh, Arkansas, um, Terrell Graham. And he was a hell of a linebacker, man. He, 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 but he was a loose cannon. He got, and I told the guy, I said, hey, you can play – but you got to keep him on the short lease. He's a, he's a loose cannon and went up there and got in trouble and ended up over at U of H. But by then he had matured a lot and he got it together and had a very successful career over at U of H. But I'm glad that I was transparent with the guy about his behavior because he, the next time he asked me about another kid, he, he, he believed me, you know? So I, 
Yeah, but I always want to. I always gonna do. I'm, I, you know, I'm gonna do what's best for my kid, man. But but I do want want them all to play for free. And you know, I don't want them to pay for school. So now, last question, gentlemen, and then and then and 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 it's on a much lighter note. Mac, can you still with me? You gone, but anyway, because it's actually involving it's involving music. Now, I know that you uh you mentor. Uh, 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 inspiring artists, and 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 you, you try to show them the way to to to, to market themselves and and to uh, break into the industry. And that we all are fans of hip hop and the things that we listen to. So I just want to talk about, but at the same time, being educated, we we also having to combat with the images of many many artists. They're having to combat with. Uh, oftentimes, what they do, what they say, is much more impactful, goes much further than anything that we would say to them. At least it appears that way sometimes. Uh, talk about the importance of the message in the music, and 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 even trying to influence students, students uh, uh, musical ear and their images and the things that they see, the stimuli that they digest. Well, first of all, man, I just I would just like to say that hip hop is is the music of our culture. It is how uh, you know at its inception was how we told the story of what was going on in our neighborhoods, going on with our people, and it has been popularized and put on mainstream. And it's hip hop is now pop music. It's the most popular genre of music in the world. You know, you see hip hop music on you know Doritos commercials, and you know you see white ladies doing yoga you know, to hip hop, you know, now. So uh to a and I and I just want to provide that context initially. Uh, they got but, trap yoga. They got trap yoga. For sure. <laughs> so uh, but but when we when we think about when we think about the images and we think about uh everything that we that we see now with artists, I, I think it's a lot better than actually and I know it's crazy that that you know me, a couple of months ago, Adar, <laughs> you know, I would have had a totally different uh, outlook on it. But I, I think I think that artists are actually doing better than we've done uh, like in the 90s and the early 2000s simply because first of all because of social media I think people are getting the not that artists themselves are you know becoming holy and changing you know the the, the message in their in their music but because of the 360 deal and because of uh, social media Consumers of music get a chance to see more so of what's going on with with their artists. Uh, artists are now a little bit more outspoken to even certain political, uh, you know, political topics and different things that are going around. So I think that kids get a a chance to look at an artist for a lot of a lot of different things other than just what they're hearing the music. Now to answer your question, yes, some of the the, the messages in music are still uh, are still atrocious. Uh, and it's it's to a younger student. For me, if I'm trying to talk to a to a fourth grade student or a fifth grade student, no, they're not on Meek Mill's Instagram listening listening out to his political views. They're not listening for Killer Mike. They're not listening to Ti for you know with them being on MSNBC and and their their ten point plan for what that needs to happen you know in the community. I don't know listening to them for that. Uh, I just think that it's a, uh, it's important. Uh, Moving forward, that again, this goes back to what we talked about way earlier uh, this evening, which was making sure that the kids know the difference. You know, they know the difference between what is what is stated in the music and 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 what's actually real life. Look, man, I I grew up. Uh, I had I had both my parents in the household. You know, but at the same time, so when a when an artist would say something about, you know, that pops not being at the crib, it wasn't that I empathized with it. Like I just, like I, I felt that cause that's what was happening to me, but because I was able to separate it from saying that, okay, that's not me, but you know what? I know a situation that's like that. So I didn't, I didn't internalize it in that way. So I think the, the best thing to do is to help educate students more through the music and give them an opportunity to know that just because that's what's being said, you don't got to go out, you know, and that, that's not, that's not who you are. It's literally more artists are becoming more successful now just from being who they are. Like I use it for an example, Kendrick, Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar, literally, he used to have a rap name, was named K-Dot and all this type of stuff, but Kendrick Lamar changed, you know what I'm saying? He went by his, his actual name. 
you know, and, and actually started just literally rapping around about stuff that he that he saw. Kendrick Lamar is not a blood, but his neighborhood is a blood neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Like so, and and I think that more kids, you know, nowadays have more opportunities than I did coming up because when I was coming up, if I was listening to Tupac, hey, I got Tupac. Or for me, it was Bone Thugs and Harmony, and it was Jay Z from you know riding around with my uncles. So if I'm listening to Bone Thugs, no, I, I couldn't tell you the, I couldn't tell you the difference. You know, or if I was listening to Jay Z talking about braggadocious, you know, crack rap, no, I didn't sell sell drugs, but yeah, I idolized it for sure. You know, but now it's like I, can't, I think kids have more opportunity to do so, but it's still important for individuals like us to keep continue to provide more education. We have a lot more advocates in hip hop music right now to uh, to kind of help guide that, and I think it's gonna get better moving forward. It's still a lot of BS going on, but it's gonna get better for sure. Well, I appreciate y'all, gentlemen, man. Uh, 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 I know you. I know it ran a little long, and I know you brothers got a lot of things to do, man. But I tell, uh, I, I initially started this because uh, I wanted, I wanted to debunk the the idea that uh, that all black people are inherently, are, are inherently criminal, and, and and so I wanted to also make sure that we took responsibility for ourselves. And, and, and we just start sharing the information because I think that everybody has a uh, sharing the information uh, um, that will contribute to to us progressing. And so I just wanted to share that because I know that I know of many of, of professional brothers such as you all who are, who are out here in, in the communities, who are out here leading, who are doing those things. And I just wanted to highlight you, brother, and I appreciate that y'all are uh, 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 helped me a great deal and shaped some of my perspective on things, and I appreciate y'all, man. So, um, I just want to say thank you one more time and to let y'all know that uh, you're listening to the uh, I am my brother's keeper version of the garage apartment. Uh, be sure to follow us. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, let, all right, y'all put out y'all's social social media uh, info if y'all have it. Coach, you got a social media coach? No, nah, he ain't got one. Anyway, Mac, you, 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 you on mute. You on mute. Hey, but uh, y'all can, uh, y'all can definitely follow me, man. Uh, Mackie HCX is my uh, Instagram, Twitter. Um, you can also follow me uh, at the Sunday Music Study. Shout out to DJ Yeti, man. Uh, you can also follow me at uh, the Motion Series dot com. Documentary I'm working on Motion Series on Instagram, Series on Twitter, Motion Series on Facebook. So, yeah, yeah Mackie's an entertaining Twitter follow, too. <laughs> there he is. There he is. He absolutely is, man. Uh, so, again, yeah. I want to thank y'all. Um, y'all be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Check out our website, thegaragepc.com. And as always, man, y'all be good. Y'all be blessed. If you can't be good, then be good at it. We'll holler at y'all till next time. Follow the Garage Department on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Yeah. Tweet, photo, video. Let me shoot some real quick. Follow me on social media. And subscribe to the Garage Department Radio on YouTube.